All right, well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our special live presentation about the Hubble Space Telescope. My name is Mike Murray. I'm the astronomer and planetarium manager for the Delta College Planetarium in Bay City, Michigan. And joining me tonight, too, is our, spo our show specialist, Brian Kennedy, who's going to be helping to answer questions in the chat. If you have anything you'd like to post in the comments, questions as we go through the presentation, please feel free to post them in there and Brian will do his best to get to those questions for you. Okay, so we're gonna take a look at what's going on with the Hubble Space Telescope. Hubble, of course, is quite the iconic telescope and observatory, almost it's become pretty much a, a household name and it's been said that the Hubble Space Telescope could very well be the greatest scientific instrument of all time. After 30 years, the Hubble has done so much more than simply give us sharper images of objects that we already knew about. It found things and posed questions that we didn't even know to ask at the time it was launched. Even before they had the capacity to build them, Astronomers were dreaming of space telescopes. In 1946, while working for the Rand Corporation, Lyman Spitzer wrote a white paper about the benefits of putting a telescope into space. Because at the Earth's atmosphere blurs the images of ground-based telescopes, the major benefit of a space telescope was the clearer view that would be obtained by locating it above Earth's atmosphere. Of course, in 1958, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration was formed only not even a year after the launch of Sputnik, and that really accelerated the idea of what we could do with space. Uh, a 1962 study by the National Academies of Sciences recommended that a space telescope become one of the U.S. national science priorities. This report spawned numerous groups to develop ideas for the observatory and its scientific instruments, not just in the US, but around the world. In 1976, NASA and the European Space Agency, ESA, joined their space telescope proposals. This collaboration helped provide broader support for the project and spread the considerable financial responsibility. And then in 1977, just a year later, the US Congress funded what was then known as the Large Space Telescope Project. In 1985, the telescope was completed, but launch was delayed, of course, due to the Challenger tragedy. It finally launched in 1990 aboard the Space Shuttle Discovery. Uh, on a personal note, I was actually there uh, on a section called the NASA Causeway, which was about eight miles from Pad 39B, which Discovery launched from, we were all out there well before sunrise, and it was amazing how many people had crowded the causeway because everyone knew what a special launch this was going to be. Uh, it doesn't matter how many times you see the shuttle launches, but especially the one with the, with the Hubble Space Telescope on it, the feeling you could feel from the crowds all around us was this combination of exhilaration and anticipation, nervousness, and even amazement. Uh, what you think of when it's launching is you see these efforts of thousands of people and millions of man hours for both the shuttle and the telescope. And it's hard not to feel a sense of pride in what humanity can accomplish in that moment. And so I think that's one of the reasons when you, if you ever get a chance to go to a, a launch of any kind, especially a big one like this, you, it really is an emotional experience. Well, to get that telescope as high as possible, it was delivered to the space shuttle's maximum range of nearly 350 miles, which is still considered low Earth orbit. Uh, and even at that altitude, Hubble orbits the Earth once about every 95 minutes. To give you an idea of just what an incredible feat of engineering this thing is, let's take a closer look. To begin with, it's huge. It required almost every inch of the shuttle's payload bay. The astronauts would often comment just how much the size amazed them, even though they were training for it and they'd seen it. When they saw it finally 
getting close to delivery and getting installed in the shuttle bay, they, it still just never ceased to amaze them. It took Lockheed Martin over eight years to build the Hubble Space Telescope. And remember, it's more than just a telescope. It's a spacecraft. It's got computers. It does have cameras, but it has a whole plethora of scientific instruments. That's really a lot of what is the meat and potatoes of the Hubble. Probably what you've heard about the most was its primary mirror, 94 and a half inches across. When placed above our turbulent atmosphere, it would be able to see objects 10 times sharper than even the largest mirrors on the Earth at the time. And what you probably also remember is how the mirror ended up being ground and polished super precisely to the wrong shape. Well, it wasn't by much. The outer perimeter of the mirror was only off by one eleven thousandth of an inch, but it was enough to cause a noticeable spherical aberration. Fortunately, the Space Observatory was built in a modular fashion because we knew all along that components would need to be replaced and upgraded. The first Hubble servicing mission in 1993 installed corrective optics, as well as a new camera. And the result? Well, what already appeared superior to Earth-based telescopes came out better than anyone expected. Hubble was back in business. So how did this make that galaxy picture look before and after, the one we just showed you a minute ago? Here is a before and after of that spiral galaxy known as M100. Uh, yeah, what a difference one 450th of a millimeter makes. Well, on large optics, turns out a lot. Since 1990, the Hubble Space Telescope has made more than a million observations and looked at over 50,000 celestial objects. The amount of data collected is equivalent to about 60 million books, six times the printed collection in the U.S. Library of Congress. That data has revolutionized the way we understand the universe, from the nearby objects of our solar system to the clusters of galaxies billions of light years away. So what's been the mission of the Hubble? It's way more than just a camera. It can look farther back in time than any other instrument. The deep fields, which we'll talk about, have given us fossil clues to how the universe has changed and evolved with time. It's played a key role in establishing the amount of dark matter in the universe and its distribution. Its sharper vision can see individual stars in galaxies hundreds of millions of light years away, which refine distance measurements, which helps us to understand just what the scale of the universe really is. We can see back to the very first generations of stars when their size and energy consumption were completely different than the stars of today. Studying details on the other planets at regular intervals shows how dynamic they truly are. While some of Hubble's images can represent natural colors, it has a set of camera color wheels, three of them actually, and they can be coded to different elements because there's also a spectroscope in the observatory. And the result gives us some of these most spectacular images, as much art really as they are science. So how do we know what elements are up there? Well, one of the science instruments is called an imaging spectrograph, where the light of an object is broken down into its constituent colors. And the spectrum that shows up can show lines, which are essentially chemical fingerprints of stars or gas clouds or galaxies. So let's use these various eyes of the Hubble to witness some of its most incredible discoveries. Let's start close to home with the bodies of our solar system, more than just the planets, but we're gonna talk about those at first. 
While Hubble can't match what spacecraft could see up close, it could show enough detail to keep track of the changing features on Mars. Clouds, dust storms, surface markings, ice cap advances and retreats, and other forms of ice. Stunning views of the atmospheric features on Jupiter, including the shrinking of the Great Red Spot, that huge storm in Jupiter's atmosphere. We were able to get a much better understanding of the composition and processes in Saturn's atmosphere and rings, because as you'll see, Hubble was not limited to only the visible portion of the spectrum. It could see quite a bit into the ultraviolet and just a little bit into the infrared part of the spectrum. The advantage of that is you're able to look at different frequencies, which means you're looking at different, diff, different physical processes that are going on. So that can be really helpful with telling the full scientific story of what's happening. No, this is not Saturn. You're looking at features of the planet Uranus, features that we could never see from Earth, at least not nearly this well. We were really surprised with how much the features changed in Neptune's atmosphere. We've only flown by Neptune once with a spaceship, Voyager 2, back in 1989. And we got the impression that the features there would be fairly constant, kind of like what we saw on Jupiter and Saturn. And that was not the case. And then there's the dwarf planet Pluto. Well, here is about the best image we could ever get from the Earth's surface. Even with all kinds of adaptive optics to try to correct for the atmospheric distortion, this is still about the best we could do. Well, Hubble could definitely do better, but for an object only 1,500 miles in diameter at a distance of 3.5 billion miles, I mean, you can only get so much detail. However, notice here, some of the brightness variations going on. Turns out they were quite stark. Compare that with this view from the New Horizons spacecraft, which flew by Pluto in 2015. You can see they line up pretty closely. Now, does everybody remember Comet Atlas last year? It was one of the best naked eye comets in like the last 20 years. When astronomers noticed that it might be breaking up, Hubble offered these incredible details, these all these tiny little chunks of ice and dust that were breaking apart. All right, next, let's venture out into our home galaxy, the Milky Way. Our spiral galaxy contains hundreds of billions of stars, but also clusters of stars and gas clouds called nebulae. To give you a better sense of how deep Hubble can go, I'd like to do a quick demonstration. Let's start, <clears throat> excuse me, let's start with a naked eye view of the sky, looking into the rich star fields of the southern Milky Way. We're going to zero in on a rich globular cluster called Omega Centauri, just barely visible to the naked eye under dark skies. Notice the field of view noted by the outer box, this green box here surrounding it. We're going to zoom in to that area right there. This is like the view you would get through a small telescope at low power. Let's go into the next box. Now we can start to resolve the many thousands of stars in this ancient cluster. This would be like looking through a large amateur telescope. Next box. And here's the view through a large observatory telescope with time exposure cameras. Yep, even more stars. And now let's take a deeper view through the Hubble Space Telescope. What before looked like a blurry bright white core resolves into hundreds of thousands of stars. You see this rectangle in here? It might be kind of hard to see. It's a thin green line there. Well, Hubble 
could zoom in even more. You're looking at an assortment of 100,000 stars in the crowded core of the Omega Cluster. Most are between 10 and 12 billion years old, among the oldest stars in our galaxy. The orange and red ones are nearing the end of their lives as they swell into red giant stars. Now, we could never get this kind of detail from Earth or zero in on individual stars here for detailed measurements. Probably one of the most studied objects in the entire sky is the Orion Nebula, a glowing cloud of gas and dust in the winter constellation of Orion the Hunter. At about 1,600 light years away, it's one of the nearest star forming regions to us. Hubble photography and spectroscopy have been used to create a detailed three dimensional model of this nebula, which reveals that the apparent flatness in this image is deceiving. We're actually peering into a grotto shaped cloud of glowing gases. Let's watch this three dimensional tour of the nebula so you can see for yourself. You'll see we're coming in there toward the belt stars of Orion here, and underneath the belt, there is a fuzzy glowing cloud. That is the Orion Nebula. Under dark skies, it would be just barely visible as a cloud to the naked eye. Now we're gonna overlay uh, a picture from the Hubble in visible light. And now let's use that three-dimensional model so we can actually fly into the Orion Nebula. This complex of molecules and atoms of hydrogen and helium is over 30 light years across. The stars, the individual stars that look like they're like a fountain coming out of the middle, are very young new stars that have formed out of the nebula. Some of the brightest ones in there are emitting ultraviolet radiation so strong, that's what's sculpting the cloud into all of these interesting caves and tendrils. Some of the clumps in this cloud are protostars that are still forming. In fact, here's one coming into view right there. It looks like a dark oval. We call that a protostar as the gas has not lit up with hydrogen fusion yet, which is what we mean by a star. Now you might recognize this picture. This star forming region became one of the most iconic pictures ever taken by Hubble, the so-called pillars of creation. These light and dark clouds of gas mark sites of stellar formation, stars still coming out of their birth clouds. Today, Hubble is finding nebulas shaped and sculpted by multiple sources, like this one, dubbed the Mystic Mountain. As part of the Carina Nebula, streams of charged particles from newborn stars are shaping and compressing the pillar of gas and dust, while other nearby stars eat away at other parts of the cloud. The pillar is about three light years tall. Pictures like these create an almost three-dimensional impression ball by themselves. I mean, can you tell? Looks like the way there's some superposition going on with some of these clouds. It does feel as though it has a three-dimensional texture to it. Not all nebulas in the sky are stellar birthplaces. Sometimes they can be the sites of star death, like the Crab Nebula in Taurus the Bull. These are the tattered remains of a supernova, the explosion of a massive star. In the year 1054, the Chinese, Japanese, and Native Americans recorded the appearance of an extremely bright star at this location in the sky. In fact, it turned out it, they recorded it as visible in broad daylight for several weeks before slowly fading away. Well, in that location now, Hubble shows filaments of what remains of the star, 
made mostly of hydrogen with traces of sulfur and oxygen. Supernovas can also fuse and spread heavier elements into the cosmos, including carbon, phosphorus, iron, and even gold. The Crab Nebula is still expanding. It's about six light years wide at this point, and it will continue to expand until eventually, the, in maybe a 10,000 years, it will start to fade. The Veil Nebula in Cygnus, the Swan, formed roughly 10,000 years ago. This newer release from Hubble brings out fine details of the nebula's threads and filaments of ionized gas. The fast-moving blast wave from the ancient explosion is plowing into a wall of cooler, denser interstellar gas, causing it to emit light. Less massive stars like the Sun will not detonate in supernova explosions, but their remnants can look just as spectacular. The Butterfly Nebula here contains rolling bubbles of gas heated to over 35,000 degrees Fahrenheit, speeding into space at half a million miles an hour to form these ghostly butterfly wings. The central star is a white dwarf, but it's hidden in a dark donut-shaped ring of dust. When stars like the sun get old, they will become red giants, which eventually puff off their outer layers. Sometimes those expanding layers can resemble a ring, like the Helix Nebula here. In three dimensions, they would appear probably more like a bubble or even a tube. In this case, you can see the shrunken core of the star left behind in the center, a little tiny white dwarf star, probably not much bigger than the Earth. Hubble has also given us a look at bursts of celestial fireworks. This is a young open cluster of stars buried inside the nebula NGC 3603. Yeah, I know there's a lot of nebulas that may not necessarily have names. Sometimes they go by catalog number. NGC stands for the New General Catalog, came out in the 1800s, but today it's kind of like a Bible for many amateur astronomers. The cluster here is newly formed out of the nebula, where its intense ultraviolet winds of radiation have blown out a cavity in the cloud. Some of the biggest, most energetic stars in the Milky Way are in this cluster. So the Hubble Space Telescope has pioneered other ways of measuring. And it turns out there are extrasolar planets or exoplanets that orbit around other stars. Well, the Hubble pioneered the detection and analysis of extrasolar planet atmospheres. Back in 2001, astronomers released results showing that they used Hubble to make the first direct detection of an atmosphere of a planet orbiting a star outside our solar system. Their unique observations, in this case of sodium, demonstrated that it was possible with Hubble and with other telescopes to measure the chemical makeup of an alien planet atmosphere and to potentially search then for the chemical markers of life beyond Earth. And they have discovered other markers, you know, oxygen. And usually that's an indication of life bearing processes, but we can't completely rule out non-organic sources. So it's, but it's definitely really speeding things up in terms of what we can measure around other planets in our galaxy. Well, hundreds of millions of other galaxies lie out there in the universe. Our Milky Way, of course, is just one of them. Their distances range from millions to billions of light years, which means we are looking into the past to see how they have evolved over time. The largest Hubble Space Telescope image ever assembled is this sweeping view of a portion of the Andromeda Galaxy, our nearest spiral to us, to our Milky Way. Even though the Andromeda galaxy is over 2 million light years away, 
Hubble is powerful enough to resolve individual stars in a 61,000 light year long stretch of that galaxy. You're looking at a mosaic of almost 7,400 exposures, taking over 411 individual pointings of the telescope. So we've been able to gain a huge amount of new information about our sister spiral. This is a 91 megapixel mosaic of the Whirlpool galaxy, another spiral galaxy we're looking at it face on, very similar to our Milky Way as well. This was a picture that was released on Hubble's 15th anniversary. And beyond the sheer beauty of the image, the details along the spiral arms follow the progression of star formation from dark dust clouds through pink star forming regions to blue newborn star clusters. Some astronomers believe that the whirlpool's arms are so incredibly prominent because of the effects of a close encounter with this other small yellowish galaxy. Its companion may have triggered all of this star formation as it sent gas clouds crashing into each other. As spectacular as this image is, we can again take the three-dimensional measurements of the whirlpool and generate a 3D flyby of the galaxy. You just flew by a hundred billion stars in a star city 75,000 light years across. Well, galaxies are actually kind of like snowflakes. Though the universe contains millions and hundreds of millions of galaxies flung across time and space, no two ever seem to look alike. One of the most photogenic is the huge spiral galaxy, and it goes by the romantic catalog number of UGC 2885. <laughs> it's about 230 million light years away in the constellation of Perseus, but it's massive, even by galactic standards. It's two and a half times wider than our Milky Way and contains 10 times as many stars. And that means about 1 trillion stars in this galaxy. It's been nicknamed Rubin's Galaxy after the astronomer Vera Rubin because she was the one that used this galaxy to look for invisible dark matter. She found that the galaxy is embedded inside of a huge halo of dark matter. And that can be estimated by looking at the gravitational influence on this galaxy's rotation. That was one of the ways uh, Vera was able to help confirm the discovery that dark matter exists, non-luminous matter that can't be detected any other way, except by its gravitational influence. These two spiral galaxies started to interact a few hundred million years ago, making the antenna galaxies one of the nearest and youngest examples of a pair of colliding galaxies. Nearly half of the faint objects in the antenna image are young clusters containing tens of thousands of stars. It's kind of like a fireworks of star formation when you look at all the pinks and the blues. Galaxy interactions are not always the grand collisions seen in the antenna galaxies. These two interacting galaxies have produced less pronounced distortions in each other's shape but they do kind of create an interesting example of what looks like a rose and a stem. Two spiral galaxies that take 
hundreds of millions of years to slowly interact. Turns out there are lots of examples of galaxy collisions out there. Even though there's a lot of empty space between the galaxies, galaxies also have a lot of gravity, and it's not impossible at all for them to pass near one another, especially when you're talking about millions and billions of years of time in the galactic time scale. Sometimes they will actually merge, and when they do, again, you can have the bursts of star formation. When we look onto the scale of the entire universe, remember, looking deeper into space allows us to look further back into time. And it was 1924, the American astronomer Edwin Hubble, hence the name of the Hubble Space Telescope, announced that he discovered galaxies outside of our Milky Way. He was using then what was the biggest telescope in the world, or the 100-inch Hooker Telescope in Mount Wilson in California. But by measuring the distances to these galaxies, he also noticed that the farther away a galaxy is, the faster it appears to be receding from us. And this was incro incontrovertible evidence that the universe is uniformly expanding in all directions. And looking for what's called the Hubble constant, that rate of expansion, the Hubble has given us by far the best refinement of what the Hubble constant could be like, or truly is, and what the true age of the universe is. Before Hubble, the estimates were anywhere between 10 and 20 billion years for the age of the universe. But after accurately measuring the Hubble constant and the present day expansion of the universe, we've been able to refine it to about 13.85 billion years. Another step in observing the deep universe with Hubble was to use what are called natural gravitational lenses. A gravitational lens is created when a clump of matter, like a cluster of galaxies, distorts the natural path of light around the mass and concentrate it, concentrates it to the observer. The lens both distorts and magnifies background objects. You can see some of the distortion, like with these arcs here in the picture. This is one of the best examples of a gravitational lens. And this has helped us to see objects as much as 100 times fainter than what they would normally look like. Over the years, Hubble has made a project of taking long, deep exposures into seemingly empty pockets of space called the Hubble Deep Field. The inset image of the full moon gives you an idea of the relative field of view of the latest project, the ultra deep field. That's pretty tiny, as you can see. Put another way, that covers the area of about the size of FDR's eye on a dime held at arm's length. Yeah, that small. So with an exposure time equivalent to over 11 days, this is what Hubble found. In a tiny portion of the sky that seemed to be void of anything, the deep field reveals over 10,000 galaxies, giving insight into the enormity of the universe and variety of galaxies throughout time. The smallest of the tiny red dots, if you can find one, there are some really, really tiny galaxies in here that look like they're just little red dots. Those are some of the most distant and earliest galaxies ever detected. That's because those galaxies are so distant that light took billions of years to reach us. We see them as they looked billions of years ago and somewhat redshifted too because the light is stretched out. So you're looking those little red dots are galaxies almost 13 billion years in the past, just a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. What else does the ultra deep field tell us? Well, uh, let's do a zoom out and see.
I hope that gives you a better idea of just what kind of size, what kind of tiny portion of the sky we were really looking at with all of those galaxies. Hubble has made tremendous discoveries in the past 30 years. Shown here are some of the main science themes that Hubble was designed to explore and some of the additional science themes Hubble was able to explore after new technology, installed, of course, during the servicing missions. And these are just some of the broad themes. Hubble's contributions to exploring, resolving, and opening up new mysteries within these science themes comes about because of the technological capabilities of Hubble. Hubble has made many unanticipated contributions, at least unanticipated at launch in 1990. And that's really a part of the point of why we explore. You never really know what kinds of surprises you're going to run into. And that can be really exciting because it helps us to refine our view of what is really going on in the universe, what the processes are, what its, what its future could look like. All right, well, as you probably all heard in the news, on June 13th, Hubble went into safe mode because its primary payload computer went offline. This is the unit that monitors and coordinates the science instruments. At first, it was thought to be a computer memory issue, but engineers are now actually looking at the CPU or its central processing unit or even its interface connection to other hardware. The good news, though, is that there are backup units and the teams are still working on the problem. They haven't been able to bring up the first backup unit, but, and that's why they think it could be a connection or a CPU. But the important thing to note is that these kinds of challenges aren't new for NASA. Space is a harsh environment for computers, even those that have been hardened for those conditions. Other spacecraft have experienced problems like these, and there are many diagnostics still to be run. System redundancy, remember, is NASA's middle name. And there are other units, even though they're not designed specifically for that function, but they're the same kind of unit and they can be rededicated. So anyway, don't fret or pay too much attention to the gloom and doom <laughs> that's painted sometimes out there in the media, uh, especially social media. The effort to get Hubble back online is ongoing and it might take a while. That's something that may not just happen in a few days. What about after Hubble? Well, the replacement for Hubble, in a manner of speaking, is not only a lot bigger in size, but it's also designed to look mainly in the infrared part of the spectrum. That way you can see further back into time and pierce through a lot of the blankets of dust and gas to uncover even more of what's out there. It's called the James Webb Space Telescope, named for the NASA administrator in the 1960s who oversaw the Apollo program. It is indeed big. You thought the mirror was big on Hubble? This one is over 200 inches across. It's gonna be able to gather at least four times the amount of light that Hubble could. It's also going to be orbiting a lot farther out in space in order to get more isolated thermally from the Earth and anything in near Earth orbit. Because again, if it's in infrared, you want it as cold as possible. It's currently on schedule to launch in November on the European Space Agency's Ariane 5 rocket. And this is its launch site down in French Guiana, South America. Be sure and stay tuned to our website and social media pages as the Delta College Planetarium has been selected by NASA to be one of the official hosts of the Web Space Telescope Community Events Initiative. That means we'll be putting on presentations in advance of the launch, but also a special event at the planetarium close to launch day that will include dome shows and even a subject matter expert from NASA. So we're really excited to be able to host uh, one of those uh, events and to be able to work closely with NASA because this is going to be a really exciting time for the future of space telescopes. 
So I want to thank you all very much for joining us. And uh, again, please feel free to check out uh, our many resources. Uh, we will have a lot of updates uh, on our social media pages, our YouTube channel, and of course on our website. So be sure to, to tune back in. We'll also be posting updates on our Facebook page about the progress of the Hubble and its hopeful repair and coming back online.